1 Peter chapter 2. And I want you to look in your Bibles at 1 Peter chapter 2. And I believe verse 9. Where it says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of Him who has called you out of darkness into His what? Marvelous light. We looked a little a bit of that last week. And what I want you to think about is what is the meaning of that word marvelous light? Jesus, towards the end of His ministry, was in a crowd of people. And the Bible says He cried out. Meaning that He used a very loud voice. And He cried out to the people and He said, I am the light of the world. This is the marvelous light that Peter was talking about. That God has called us out of the darkness of this world and brought us into the marvelous light of this, His Son, Jesus Christ. And that through Him, we are able to understand the will of God for our lives. Do you realize that God actually has a will for your life? And then do you know what that will is? The first part of that will is He wants you to be saved. The second part is He wants to have a relationship with you. The third part of what God's will is, is that you actually allow yourself to be used by Him to extend His kingdom of grace. That is the will of God. And this is what Jesus has come to give us, to share with us, to show us, and to work in us and through us. So as Gary read Luke, let's turn back to those texts. That's Luke chapter 22, verse 41. This is when Jesus brings his disciples. They had finished the Last Supper. He commemorates the communion service. And then they go out to the Mount of Olives. And they come to the Garden of Gethsemane. We've been studying about this in our Sabbath school class. Do you know what the word Gethsemane means? It means oil press. And the garden that he went to was a garden of olive trees, and in that garden was an oil press. Now, this is in the spring. So in the spring, in Jerusalem at that time, the nights are cold, and the dew is heavy. So it's probably not historic that they slept outside. But an oil press would give them a place to go and find shelter. Hence, Gethsemane had an oil press. Since the olives would be pressed in the uh, fall, this is the spring, it wouldn't be used. Okay? The symbolism of this event, where Jesus goes in with his disciples into this olive press, He's able to see and know what an olive press does. What does an olive press do? You take the olives, then they would put a big stone over it with a lever, and the stone would apply weight to those olives, and it would press out the oil. Very symbolic of what was happening to Jesus at this time. When he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane, you find this in the uh, Gospel of John. I'm going to stop moving here. You find this in the Gospel of John. It says that Jesus, as he was crossing over the brook Kidron, an angel came and strengthened him. You read in the Desire of Ages that after the celebration of the Passover meal, when he commemorated communion, after that is when the sins of the world started to be put upon him. And at that point, you have to really think of what it would be like to be Jesus at this point. You have never known what sin was in your entire earthly existence, but you have to realize that your birth date on this planet was not your beginning. You've never had a beginning. And prior to taking humanity, you would never have an ending. And in that whole time, 
There was never a separation between you and your Father and the Holy Spirit. Can you turn that down some? That's good. And with this communion that you've had with your Father, all the days of your life, you take on humanity and you still have this communion. It's never been broken. But when you come to the Garden of Gethsemane, and now you're taking upon yourself the sin of an entire world, those who have lived before you, those who were living in the time of Jesus, and those who would live after he went back into heaven all the way to the end of the close of probation, he took on all that sin. And that sin started to separate him from his father. This is why you find that it's written that he started to sweat, what, water? Blood. Great drops of blood. That only happens under extreme duress. Now, prior to this time, Jesus tells his disciples that my soul is sorrowful even unto what? Prior to that time, did you ever read anything in the Gospel accounts about Jesus being depressed? About Jesus being sad outside of standing up of Lazarus' tomb? And he cried? And he cried over Jerusalem? But this was different. He was crying because of the people, of others. This is the first time you see him focusing on himself. You guys ever notice that? Why was he focused on himself here? When he comes to the garden and in these texts, he tells his disciples to watch and pray. And he goes a stone's throw distance from them and he prays to his father. Father, if it's possible, what? Let this cup pass from me. What is that telling you? He was Say that loud, Ricky. He was human. And what did you say, Diane? He was, he was having trouble bearing the burden. This is showing you his humanity. Because his humanity is crying out. He did not want to go to the cross. He knew what was coming. But what I want you to think about is what took place from leaving the upper room where they had the uh, Last Supper and going down the trail to the Garden of Gethsemane. Turn with me to the Gospel of John. John chapter 13. Verse 4. No, that's actually where he actually washes the feet of his disciples. But let's look at that anyway, and then I'll wrap up with what I want you to see. Verse 4 says, Jesus rose from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and did what? Gird it himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And when he came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, what? Lord, are you washing my feet? What was this Peter's reaction? Shouldn't it have been Peter's job to do that? Shouldn't it have been John's job, Judas's job, Mark or Matthew's job? And yet, they were looking for the servants, which they failed to get. Okay? So who is it that actually steps up and performs the role that these guys should have done. And Jesus tells him plainly, what I'm doing for you right now, you do not understand. But I set before you an example. If Jesus said, I set before you an example, don't you think that his followers should follow this example? Mm -hmm. And this is why the Seventh-day Adventist Church still practices foot washing. I've never seen this practice done before in any of the churches that I visited. Yes, ma'am? I have the Hard Shell Baptist really? years and years ago in Georgia. The first time I've seen this done, I thought that, wow, you guys are really, really strange. And uh, 
But as I started to study why it's done, I saw from Scripture. But what happens with everything that we do regularly, we tend to lose the significance of why we do this. Also, I'm just really, really excited about how many people showed up today. Amen. Because communion service is one of the least attended services uh, that the church offers. Okay? And I'm just, like I said, really excited that how many people showed up. It's probably because we didn't announce it in the bulletin. <laughs> <laughs> But I want you to understand what this conversation means when he's talking to Peter. Peter said, Lord, you should never wash my feet. And what does Peter, or Jesus say to Peter? <coughs> All right. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. This is verse 8. And Jesus answered, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. You've got to love Peter. Because Peter right after that says, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, He who is what? Needs only to have his feet washed. What did Jesus mean? He who is bathed. There you go. Do you think Peter was baptized? Do uh, you think he listened to John when John was preaching by the Jordan? Baptizing a message of repentance because of the one who would follow him. And Peter accepted that one that followed him. So Jesus is saying plainly that if you have been baptized, you don't need to be baptized over and over and over again, but you just need to have your feet washed. Hence the importance of the foot washing ceremony in the communion service. In our Sabbath school class, we're tracing the footsteps of Jesus and the writer and the narrator of these videos we're watching uh, expressed it really, really well. He said that during this course of life, we step in stuff. Hence, we need to have our feet. It's a good way to put life, right? So listen, if you are a baptized follower of Jesus Christ, you're going to step in stuff, right? You don't need to be washed from head to toe. You just need to have your feet Because the rest of you is clean in Christ Jesus. You need to understand the depth of what that means. Do you realize that Jesus made provision for you in your converted state that if you mess up, if you sin, you're not cast away? And He made that plain. This is what will keep you grounded and not be tossed to and fro by every strange wind of doctrine that comes down the pike in this church. Okay. It will keep you grounded when people start talking about perfectionism. It will keep you grounded when you start worrying about the mistakes you've made and if Christ will accept you. If you have been bathed, then you only need to have your what? Now, the caveat of that is the, I just lost the word. The condition, there you go. The condition of that, to have that kind of relationship, still comes down to this one word that we've been preaching on over and over again, and that's the word called obedience. Right? Now, was Peter obedient to his Lord? It all depends on what day it was, right? right. Uh, when he confessed Jesus to be Lord and the Christ, he was obedient. But I believe the next word out of his mouth when Jesus said that he was going to the cross, Peter said, this will never happen to you. And Jesus called him Satan. Right? So was Peter obedient to his Lord and Master? No, it depends on what day you're asking was Peter ever kicked out of the fold? No. Now, Peter, his greatest mistake that has been written down for all of history to see, for all of eternity, is that he denied his Lord not once, not twice, but what? 
But yet Jesus' own words were, go tell the disciples and Peter. Did he lose his place? No. Did he need to be rebaptized? No. I want you to think about that, because he denied his Lord three times. Watch them be put to death. And the one you find by the foot of the cross was John. And all the women. Right? But yet, Peter still had a place. Is that right? What was the difference between Peter and Judas? Repentance. Judas lost his place. What do you mean repentance? What kind of repentance? Judas, Judas was sorry that he betrayed his Lord. He took the money that they gave him and he threw it on the steps of the uh, temple. That's a, that's a that's not what real repentance is, right? See, and that's the difference between whether your baptism and your relationship with Jesus Christ will allow you to just have your feet washed or whether you need your whole body cleansed. Right? And the only one that can answer that is yourself. You know you're walking to the Lord. Is it real? Is it true? Do you believe? Is belief enough? Because no. the devils believe. Are they saved? James tells you that faith without works is what? That's faith without belief. Right? The belief is what constitutes the work. I do these things for Jesus Christ because I believe in Jesus Christ. And if I was to keep quiet, I would explode. Because there's just something that wells up inside of me that wants me to share what Christ has done in my life. And what He has revealed to me about Himself. That this is a Savior that loves me so much that He knew who I was what I would be, what I would do, and He loved me enough to go to the cross so that I could be with Him through I come. This is my personal walk with Jesus Christ, and this is why I continue to walk with Him today. And by the grace of God, I want to be able to continue to walk with Him all the days of my life. It is because of what He has done for me. As I close this, let me see if I can find this real quick. Turn to chapter 18 of John. When they left the upper room, they get down on this narrow trail and they head to the brook Kidron. Verse 18 says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Do you know? What they used this brook Kidron for? In the temple, say it loud because you're right. The blood from the sacrifice is drained into it. Now listen. So they just ate the Passover meal, right? And he changed the significance from Passover to communion. So that's telling you that they have made the sacrifices in the temple of the Passover lamb. A census was taken, and at one Passover, they slew well, 236,500 lambs. Do you know how much blood that would be coming down into that brook? Now, it was a full moon that night. Passover happens at the same time every year, right? can tell whether it's a full moon you go back in history. It's a full moon that night. A month before the Passover, they would whitewash the tombs that were right on the side of the hill as you walk down to the brook of Kidron. And so as he leaves the upper room, and he's walking in the light of the full moon, he can see the whitewashed tombs of these graves, knowing what's going to come. That his death is imminent. As he gets to the brook of Kidron, and he sees it in the light of the moon. The water isn't white. It's what? Red. It's red. Knowing that he is going to shed his blood 
And the spirit of prophecy and the desire of ages tells you when he gets there, he collapses. And an angel comes and strengthens him. Do you understand what in his humanity he went through for you and I? This wasn't an easy decision for him to make. If it was easy, he wouldn't have prayed three times for it to pass from him. Do you realize that your fate, my fate, and the fate of the world hung in the balance in these moments and this time in the Garden of Gethsemane? If in his humanity he said, I don't want to go through with this, what would have happened to you? What would have happened to me? Here's another thing to think about. In that direction, when he left the upper room and heading towards the brook Kidron to the Garden of Gethsemane, if he would have just kept walking past the garden, went over the mountain, and went to the other side, there was the desert. He would have been safe there because he could have hid in the desert. They wouldn't have been able to find him. Because that's where all the crooks, all those that were running away from the law, that's where they went to, to not be arrested. Now, when he came to the garden, you better, you, you, you can just think that he looked and said, if I just keep walking. And he kneels down and he prays, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. He could have got up then and kept walking. Took his disciples. Maybe waited another year. If you were him and you've come all this way your entire life and the fate of the world is hanging in the balance here, and you look at these 12 men and they're fighting about who's going to be the greatest in your kingdom. And they have no idea what your kingdom's going to do. Don't you think that played on his heart as well? Can you imagine the temptations that Satan was bringing to his mind at that point? To get him not to go through with the plan of salvation. But could the plan have waited another year? Throw all so I tell you this to let you also think about the end of time. The Bible tells you plenty there will come a day, there will be a day of judgment. The book of Joel tells you it's going to be a day like no other day. Who can stand in it? There are timetables that God has. Is that right? The birth of Jesus? The death of Jesus? Now the death of Jesus, that prophecy, was it just to a certain year? Was it to a certain day in a certain year? Yes. Was it to a certain hour of a certain day of a certain year? Yes. yes. And you get to find out that they killed the Passover lamb at a certain time, and Jesus was the Passover lamb. You find out that this wasn't just an hour, but it was to the very exact seconds. That's how accurate that prophecy is. And then... So, can it be trusted? Yeah. And that is one of the foundational beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, is the 2300-year prophecy. That's what makes us different, and that's why we are called to a different message in a different past than any other church that God has. It is to proclaim the coming of Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, look around you today, that coming is soon. Sooner than I would have ever thought 10, 20 years ago. You are seeing prophecy fulfilled right before your very eyes. As you celebrate communion this morning, all I want you to think about is how much God loves you. This is why we celebrate this. It's not a dead ceremony hasn't lost its meaning if you open yourself up to what God has done for you and you realize this grape juice symbolizes his blood that he spilled and he didn't have to and he didn't want to in his humanity. He didn't want to at that point. But you know what? He wasn't selfish. And he cared more about you than he cared about himself. And he said, nevertheless, Father, not my will be done. And the Father said, there is no other way. Doesn't it amaze you that after the third prayer, and he's strengthened by the angel, they never asked to have this cup taken from him again? 
and there is nothing that changes his mind. All that he goes through, all that he does, and he does it. What keeps him there? What keeps him in front of Pilate? What keeps him in front of the high priest? What keeps him on the cross? His love for you. When you say that, don't say us. Say you, because you have to understand this on an individual basis. Because for some of us, it's easy to see how God loves others. It's harder for us to see how God could love you. Right? God loves you. As we dismiss, we will do the foot washing. Uh, the men will be in the social hall. The women will be out in the blue door room.